movies. No? Okay, we're here. I have a real quick disclaimer before I get started um, that there are going to be pictures of, from inside a museum in here, and generally as a practice, I try not to get any sort of uh, pictures of animate objects or human remains, but it's certainly possible. I don't know that it matters for anybody in here, but some groups it does. So in 2014, the Musée des Histoires Mutuelles Guimé uh, in Lyon, France, will reopened in a beautiful new building, but with a new name. Now called the Musée des Confluences after its location on the confluence of the Rhone and Saône, Saône River, uh, and also according to a staff member at the confluence of science and culture, the museum explicitly rejects the association with natural history. In disavowing the legacy of their museum and its collections as natural, what is the museum addressing and to what effect? This paper explores this disavowal and its implications, especially as a method of decolonizing the museum. Ultimately, I argue that while the Musée des Confluences tries to redefine the displays of a natural history collection, they are unwittingly reiterating many of the problematic colonial presumptions and forms seemingly inherent to the foundationally colonial institution of the museum. The process by which the museum defines its identity in the contemporary I'm calling recollection. Recollection is a process by which identity is constantly formed and reformed in the process of citing different memories and histories. For the museum, recollection can most effectively be recognized when new exhibits open or old exhibits are redone in their interpretive texts and labels. Accordingly, this paper evaluates what disavowals are embodied in the Musée des Confluences recollections of itself as a non-natural history museum. The critiques from scholars like Amy Lone Tree and Tony Bennett of Natural History Museums are generally not on the uh, exhibition of cultural objects, but in their disproportionate dis display of indigenous material culture in natural history museums, as opposed to the dearth of material culture from the West or any civilized societies. Bennett, among many others, identifies this as an effect of the colonial project, which was premised upon gaining knowledge power of and over colonized populations. To Bennett, as a project of colonialism, categorical knowledge of the world was necessary in order to manipulate it. These colonial legacies of natural history museums, of inequity of display, and legacies of racist collecting must be addressed, Amy Lone Tree argues, for healing to be made possible for the aggrieved communities. Crucial for Lone Tree is converting museums from sites, sites of oppression to places that matter. For natural history museums to be places that matter, they would have to deconstruct the colonial frameworks upon which they are founded. And to do this would be both to heal the colonized populations represented in the museum and to heal the colonizers of their superiority, in, their superiority complexes in, insofar as it's possible in a museum. The process that Lone Tree borrows from Linda Tui Y. Smith, among many others, is called decolonizing. For Smith, this is both a process of deconstructing colonial paradigms, but also empowering the disempowered in the wake of these paradigms. For Lone Tree, in order for natural history museums to decolonize, they must explicitly address and deconstruct the colonial hierarchies upon which they are founded as a means of taking responsibility, both for the institutional past and for its obligations to the future in correcting the past. So let's now turn to some exhibit examples at the Musée des Confluences. In the first gallery accessible from the stairs and the elevators, guests are introduced to origins, stories of the world. This gallery is divided into two narratives, however. On the left-hand side of the gallery, the tale of evolution, the origin of our species, and the scientific tree of life. On the right-hand side of the gallery, taking almost no floor space, but wrapped along the wall projecting out into the square-shaped room, are stories about the origins of life. This narrative tracks many indigenous origin stories as they relate to the collections in the museum. This narrative gives the, ga gives the gallery a decidedly post-colonial feel, Indigenous origin stories are presented as an equivalent to scientific understandings of human origins. This indicates that the disavowal in this gallery is one in which natural history is a primary way of knowing to the detriment of indigenous ontologies they may even represent in the same institution. This relationship between Western and indigenous ontologies has historically marked indigenous ways of knowing as evolutionarily backward. This makes the recollection of the origins permanent exhibit poignant and a strong example of a decolonizing approach to display. Across the hall sits the Permanent Gallery Society's Human Theater. This, this space is divided into three themed sections, organizing, exchanging, and creating. 
can see it there, left to right, mainly. In between the organizing and exchanging sections is a video interactive, which is kind of housed in here and then also back here. Um, is a video interactive uh, on the topic of justice, asking visitors to engage with how they may react to many hypothetical scenarios realistically rather than theoretically. So asking them, what would you do rather than what do you think? This interactive challenges visitors to consider how they might personally fall short of endorsing the kind of world that they believe they want to see, leaving them with pra pragmatic considerations of how to change their habits. And what ultimately comes off as a more traditional natural history gallery, which I will talk about more in a minute, this justice interactive stands out as a disavowal of a version of natural history that is oriented towards pastness or towards a sterilized set scientific understanding, knowing for the sake of knowing especially. Interestingly, the justice interactive does not include objects and in this way might be seen as a particularly generative recollection where many re recollections emerge from the material potentialities of their collections, the museum's collections, this one seemed to emerge from a socio-historical context which likely would have had, would, would have at least in part addressed the imaginary of natural history museums. The disavowals in the recollections of the Musée, Musée des Confluences seem to address many of the concerns voiced by Lone Tree and Bennett. The premise of this decolonial process for the Musée des Confluences seems to be the equivalent treatment of different ontologies. In doing so, many of the evolutionary hierarchical presumptions are deconstructed in a very productive way. Despite these well-intentioned considerations, the museum's recollections will always have durable colonialisms that are tethered to the museum form. This makes the effectiveness of the disavowal crucial in the success of its decolonizing. Because the museum is not embracing its own legacy and reiterated futures as a natural history museum, it must effectively reject the colonial durabilities of the natural history museum form. While Origins does a laudable job in reorienting the relationships between scientific and non-Western accounts of the origins of life, its treatment of the evolutionary and non-Western takes are far from commensurate. Could pop back to that. Uh, slide three shows the introduction to the parallel trajectories. On the left is the origin, our, our origins of human primates. On the right is stories about the origins of life. The scientific trajectory on the left frames the narratives in the parameters of truth. These are not subjective stories like the non-Western beliefs, but truths to be learned and accepted. Consistently, and especially in origins, interpretive texts recall the beliefs, stories, or thoughts, etc., regarding indigenous ontologies. Nowhere are scientific beliefs actually commensurately treated. Uh, th this makes the Musée de Confluence complicit with one of the very legacies that they clearly made great efforts to try and avoid. In the Society's Gallery, in which indigenous com communities were represented in the organized and exchange sections, so all throughout these two sections of the gallery, there's a lot of indigenous materials and uh, non-Western materials. Um, but indigenous folks are not represented in the CREATE section that highlighted innovation and scientific, scientific advancement. The CREATE section features toasters, cars, a mechanical loom, and a large assortment of telephones. In a gallery in which many tend to start left to right, you may find yourself beginning your tour with an Aboriginal Australian art piece and ending with Western scientific innovation. The evolutionary presumption here, while potentially accidental, is certainly explicit. And while the exhibit is not intended to be te a temporally linear in any way, its iconic relationship with the Natural History Museum makes it impossible to avoid such associations. And you can actually see too that you can't enter straight in, so you have to either go left or right when you come into the exhibit. This is the entrance right here. In disavowing the natural, the Musée de Confluence has sought to disassociate from racist colonial legacies of natural history museums and become a place that matters. They have done so by attempting to equivalently treat indigenous ontologies, present indigenous peoples as of the contemporary, and promote pragmatic means to achieve a just society. In this context, disavowing the natural provides opportunities to distance from the problematic legacies that potentially legitimate, legitimates new approaches in a, in a way traditional natural museums, uh, especially in traditional locations, might not be able to legitimate. 
However, the disavowal means that any strong and iconic relationship to natural history museums might make the institution seem short-sighted in consideration of natural history museum imaginaries. It's impossible to reiterate many of the features of natural history museums, but only disavow a term, natural history, to avoid negative associations of these museums. To sufficiently disavow these legacies, the Musée des Confluences must, must reject the iconic indexical forms of the natural history museum, not just the signifier. This is what Amy Lone Tree is calling for in decolonizing museums. Museums cannot forget to recollect their problematic histories because they are founded upon them. Moreover, the healing that is necessary for the aggrieved communities comes from museums sufficiently and explicitly addressing the legacies of violence upon which they're founded. The violences have not just been in collecting the, of the materials, but in the recollecting of the materials each time they are interpreted and reinterpreted. These recollections re represent new citational forms that are both authorized by and authorizing of public imaginaries of such things as indigeneity, race, and natural history. In this way, disavowals might be seen as a mechanism of the privileged as only aggrieved communities ultimately suffer from the reiteration of the terms and materials of their forms. Disavowal of the natural in the Musée des Confluences is a disavowal of responsibility for suffering as much as it is an endorsement of indigenous ontologies. It is as much a disavowal of healing as much as it is a narrative of survival. For natural history museums like the Musée des Confluences, healing can, cannot come by disavowing the histories of pain. Thank you.